My name's Craig, and I'm a long-term member here at the Union Church. It must be about five years now. And co-leader of the men's small group with Rodrigo. He's gone. <laughs> there he is with Rodrigo, a great friend and a partner in the ministry, fellow missionary. Served with Reach Global, Evangelical Free Church, with the church planting um, mission. And married to Alessandra with my daughter, Alicia. John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him. And I will show myself to him. It was the hardest time of my life. Well, one of the most difficult times of my life. I had just entered a tunnel. There were no lights. And as I went into that tunnel deeper and deeper, month after month, turned into a year, turned into two years, I became troubled in spirit, desperate. Maybe you've been there. You're in that dark place and there's no exit. You don't know how long it will be. Many years before, I had given my life to Jesus. I came to believe in Jesus Christ, and I loved him as a teenager. As a teenager, I loved Jesus, and had friends come to know Jesus, and I discipled them. I decided to go to a, a Christian university by somebody else, because all my teen years, I was the discipler. I was involved uh, in campus ministries. There was no one there to, um, there was kind of a vacuum in, in older Christians at a Christian university, so there was really no one to disciple me. So my freshman year, they called me chaplain, and I began to disciple students all through college. One of the things I noticed at college was there was a church nearby, so I attended church, but I wasn't part of the church. All my ministry was on campus or at the local high school. And it was four years without the local church. I continued to love Jesus, but there was something missing, that element of the local church. When I graduated, my brother-in-law invited me to disciple some teenagers in a new church plant. At the same time, I talked to a, an elder of the church, and he began to disciple me. 22, 23 years old. Wow. In my 20s, I was in love with Jesus. I loved him. I sensed a call to, mission, to, to, um, to pastoral ministry. I went to seminary, and I was ordained. Eight years in youth ministry, and my passion was Jesus. I loved him through all the ups and low downs of youth ministry and through uh, participating and leading a number of short-term missions trip, I sensed an irresistible call to the mission field. That's another story for another time. But I was in another country when I sensed this call and the pastor of that local church said to me, <clears throat> excuse me. was English. Craig! Craig! You have the call. Have you considered being a missionary? My team that I led said, this is what you were born to do. I never forgot those words of life. And Eric Liddell, the great uh, Olympic runner who wouldn't run on Sunday, he said to his sister, when I run, I feel God has made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. I felt the pleasure of the Lord in that foreign context. I knew that I had a call to be a missionary. Over the year, 
I transitioned out of youth ministry. I was working towards being a missionary. I was working for my father. And the months turned into a year. And a year turned into a second year. And when you're in your late 20s, early 30s, and you sense you have a call, two years seems like eternity. And it seemed like I went into a tunnel. I thought the Lord called me here, but now there's nothing. There's no light. When, Lord? How long, Lord? And I remember sitting on my bed one night, and the tears came down, and I was desperate, and I said to him, how long, O oh Lord? How long will I wait? And this kind of thing doesn't happen to me very often. But as real as this pulpit is here, as real as Patrick is in front of me, these words came down in front of me on a sign. I can still see the setting in my room, the bed, the color of the sheets, and the words, the beautiful words. Honor your father. And at once, those tears of anguish turned into tears of peace and release. And it all made sense. I loved my father. I didn't love working for my father. But now I see that God's call for my life at this moment was to honor my dad to honor my father. I loved my dad, and I knew that I could do that for as long as the Lord wanted me to do that. And I went into work the next day and said, Dad, I know I'm, God, I'm, know I'm going to be a missionary. The Lord visited me in a very real way, but I know, too, that I'm here now to honor and serve you, and I'll do that as long until he shows me the next step. You know what happened? We began to change my, my role there at, the, at, the, at, the, um, at, the, at my dad's business. And at that point forward, it would be another two years till I arrived in Brazil. But something happened. At that moment, I began to get direction. I soon found the mission that I would be serving with. I serve with until today, Reach Global. I soon found the place where I'd be coming, Brazil. I began to raise support, and in two years' time, the Lord called me to Brazil. Well, why do I share that story? Today's text is a similar context. The disciples are about to enter a dark tunnel. You remember we've been studying the words, the last words of Jesus to his disciples. And a week ago, Jesus came riding on a donkey into Jerusalem with the whole city like carnival saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. The disciples recently came to say, you are the Christ. And as David was a warrior king, the Messiah would come and he would get rid of the Romans, destroy them militarily. And Israel would rise up and be a world power forever and ever. And here we go. Five days later on a Thursday night, Jesus comes. He's no longer with the multitude. He's no longer with the 120 or the 70, but 12. Which 12? Those who loved him. Jesus called those who loved him to be near him. And Jesus was not dressed as a king, but as a servant with a towel around his waist. And physically, he was troubled. Peter said, I'll have none of this. And then he began to say, one of you, one of my beloved, will betray me. Peter, you will deny me. I am leaving now. But you know where I'm going, and you know the way. What did the disciples, how did the disciples respond? Do you remember when he says, you know the way? Well, you don't know the way. <laughs> Show us the way. And how did Jesus respond? He's troubled. I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. 
Love me. Remain in me. It's brought you so far, but now you're going to need it more than ever. No one comes to the Father but through me. What did the disciples say? Show us the Father, Jesus. Just show us the Father, please, Jesus. Just that one thing and we'll be okay. And how did Jesus respond? Are you kidding? Philip, you've been with me all this time. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father, I am one. I am in the Father. If you don't believe for my words, believe for everything I've done. It's not me who does it. It's what God does. And this is what Jay, Pastor Jay preached last week. The works. It's the Father doing them through me. And soon you will be in me through the Holy Spirit and you will do greater things. And it brings us to our text today where Jesus... Love me. Love me. Love's result is submission. Surrender, we sang that. Obedience to my commands. Love's reward, we're going to see in today's text, an ever-growing portion of God himself in our lives. Amen? Let's stand. We're going to pray, and then we're going to read the text together. Open our hearts, O oh Lord, open our eyes, open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, that we might perceive, that we might know, that we might love Jesus. We surrender ourselves in Jesus' name, amen. Great. John 14, 15 through 31. It's also in your bulletin, but we have it up here as well. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Now, remember, this is the 12. This is that context I just talked about. Jesus just said, I'm leaving the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives in you, and you will... in. And I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my command, he is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. 
But he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. And they went on to the garden of Gethsemane, the beginning of that long tunnel with these words of life. Please be seated. Jesus comes out in verse 15 very boldly. If you love me, keep my commands. And four times this relationship between love and obedience is mentioned in these 16 verses. It's repeated and repeated and repeated. If you love me, keep my commands. In verse 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And in verse 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. Now we need to remember the context of these verses because the church is filled with religious institution that make obedience the main thing. And we begin to lose sight of Jesus. And I'd like to suggest to you that Jesus is not talking to the world here. Jesus is not talking to all Christians here. Jesus is not talking to all crenches. You can go down to Carnival today, see people dressed up like with horns on their head, men dressed like women, and they'll say, I'm a crenche. In this text, Jesus is talking to who? Those who love him. Those who have given up all. Jesus said, commanded, come, follow me. And one left his tax collector post and all that money. He said, come, follow me. And he was a zealot fighting for the rebellion. He said, come follow me. And two brothers said bye to their dad. They kissed him. And they gave up all to follow Jesus. And day by day, Jesus showed them he was the Christ. He was live. He was the way. And they loved him. So when Jesus is saying, if you love me, keep my commands, he's saying, remain in me. If you love me, it will be evidenced you will obey my commands. Obedience is always the result of our love for Jesus. And if you think it through, what were the commands of Jesus to his disciples? What were Jesus' commands? We have the Old Testament commands. The Old Testament was based on obedience. But that didn't work. It showed us we cannot obey. We're failures at it. So the new and better Alianza, covenant was this. I will write it on your heart. You will love me, and I will love you, and I will change your heart so that you want to obey. If you look through the book of John for Jesus' commands, see if we've got them up there. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, ladies. In John 13, Jesus says, A new command I give you in that, that, that setting with the disciples. Love one another. That's when he washed their feet. But throughout the book of John, these are the commands that Jesus gave. Now, I will admit, to prepare for this sermon, I read chapters 13, 14, 15. I read them several times. I read 14 five times. I put over 15 hours of observation, interpretation, application into it. But I did not read the whole book. So I let Piper did that. I read some notes, and he said, I went through the whole book. If you look through the books, and I copy this, I hope he did a good job. Jesus commanded, receive me in 112. Follow me. Get up, he said to the crippled man. Rise from the dead, he said to Lazarus. Believe in the light. Believe in God. Believe in me. Abide in me. Ask whatever you wish. Abide in my love. Receive the Holy Spirit. We're not talking about a works-based 
salvation. We're saying, love me. Remain in me. And the obedience that comes out will be a result of me being in you and you being in me. The second point is the reward of loving Jesus. The first point was the result of loving Jesus, our obedience, our surrender, our submission to his mission. But the second point is this, the reward of loving Jesus, an ever-increasing portion of God himself in our lives. And this is the mystery of the gospel. Let us take a look. Jesus said in 15, if you love me, keep my commands. And then he says this, and I will. And we see through the rest of the chapter all the things that God will do as a reward of our intimacy with him. Do we have that up there? Let's go. Yeah, let's go to the next one. He says this, I will ask the Father. Did you know that Jesus is our advocate? Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father on behalf of yourself, pleading your case. He is our advocate. But he says, I will ask the Father, and the Father will provide for you another advocate, a second advocate. Here in Brazil, we say, advogado, lawyer. You have two lawyers on your side, folks. Jesus and the Holy Spirit, another advocate. And what will be his role? He will help you, and he will be with you. For how long? Forever. The Spirit of truth. Then he throws out a warning. Warning. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But he continues on. Is it up there? Verse 17 and 18. You know him. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then he throws out another warning. Before long, the world will not see me. But in 19, he says, but you will see me. You who love me will see me. And on that day when the Holy Spirit comes, you will realize that I am in the Father. You are in me and I am in you. How can that be possible? The creator of the ends of the earth, the galaxies, the universe, that fit in his very hand, that is bigger than time itself, outside the borders of time, he abides and he dwells in us. Jay said something very important last week. Although Jesus said, I and the Father are one, yes, they are one, but they are distinct. Never believe that this is saying that you are God. In God's mystery, we are one with him. He dwells in us. But although we are alone in the image, we are only an image. And we point to him when we love him. Our submission to his mission pr provides great commission, co-commission, commission And God is exalted through us. But we have this unity, an ever-increasing portion of God in our lives. The one who loves me will be loved my father. I too will love him and I will show myself to him. Someone pointed this out to me. Have you ever been on a safari? Would you like to go on a safari? Who would like to go on a safari? Tonight, this morning we're going to go to Africa. I think it's Africa. There's elephants there. and This could be other places too, but I'm the guide. Welcome. I'm Craig and uh, uh, we are in uh, South Africa at a reserve. I'm glad you showed up on time. It's very early. The animals are just rising. And we're going to get to the watering hole before the animals do, okay? So get your cameras out. Come on, get them out. Where are your cameras? Get them out. No, really, get them out. There it is. Get it out. Get ready. Let's go here. I need a little assistance. Now, is that all we got? Is there anything there on the next one? <laughs> it's a little darker than I thought. <laughs> you get to the watering hole, and you're like, what's this? I paid for this, 
and you really can't make anything out. It's as if nothing is there. Go ahead to the next one. Ah, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The sun comes up, and you can just barely make out a bump. Oh, it's a rock. It's nothing. This was a jip. Okay, shh. Boys, I'm going to scare you. Get your cameras ready. Okay, let's go to the next one. Aha. Uh-huh. As the lights come on, we see more clearly. Nothing's changed there except our perspective as the lights come on. It is. It is an animal. It's an elephant. And it looks like he's like standing on a rock or an island or something. Okay, let's go to the next one. Aha. Uh-huh. In the end, there's a mom, a dad, and a little baby elephant. Everybody goes, oh, and they're taking their pictures. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my father. I, too, will love him and show myself to him. When we obey the commands of God, even when we're in the tunnel, when we cry out to him and say, how long, O Lord? He says, honor your father. Okay, Lord, I will be here. I will not go there until you tell me what happens. The lights come on. Our conversion is like lighting come on in the church. Boom, they come on. And we think we see, but we really don't see well. Our walk with Jesus is like a dimmer switch. When we obey his commands, the lights come on a little more. And we get a better perspective. Of course, God's love doesn't grow. It's complete. It's full at Calvary. There could be nothing greater than that. But as we obey, we see it more clearly. He becomes more beautiful. He is the one who's more excellent. And we obey a little bit more, and guess what happens? The lights come on more. 20 years from now, if you were walking with Christ, if you love him, if, if you're, you're, your obedience is a result of that, You will see more clearly than you do today. If you're going through a tunnel, remain in Christ. Abide in him. Love him. An ever-increasing awareness of God's love and presence in our life. An ever-increasing awareness of God's revelation. And an ever-increasing awareness of his peace. I just want to touch base on peace. Because at this point, Judas, not Iscariot, one of the disciples, can't stand it. And he erupts, he interrupts Jesus, and he says, stop. Stop. Why, Lord? Why do you intend to show yourself only to us and not to the world? They're always great, huh? They have these really real, we ask that. Why can't my father-in-law see Jesus? Why can't the world, why don't you show yourself? It doesn't make sense. Why is worship so personal and beautiful to me, but there's many who'd rather be on the streets parading like, I don't know. And Jesus brings it back to one issue in verse 24. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. And Jesus always builds his case on those who love him versus those who don't love him. He goes on to say, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What is the peace that the world offers? What is the peace that the world asks for? Oh, 
show you are good enough. He says, I can't talk anymore because the prince of this world comes. Judas Iscariot had just left and the ball was rolling. You must know those who love me. Satan is coming for me, but he does not have a hold over me. They would see him be killed and laid in a tomb. But Satan does not have a hold over me. Satan comes so that the world may see that I love my Father. I honor my Father with my life. And I do everything he commands me to do. So Jesus doesn't only command us to love him and obey him, but he says, I have done it for you. I have showed you. I love my daddy. And although this is going to hurt, and although this is going to send you into a dark tunnel, Satan does not have a hold on us. We win. And the world will know that I love my father. And then he says, come now, let us go. Whew. Are we ready? Are we ready to go, church? Are you ready to confront the tunnel? My question for you, me, this carnival morning, do you love Jesus? This was for the disciples. But he says, anyone who loves me will obey me. Then he opens it up. Whoever, anyone. The Holy Spirit is given to all of us. We're in an exciting time. Yes, there are dark times. But the gospel is going to all the nations. The battle is at foot. And Satan does not have a hold of us. Do you love Jesus? In closing, there's just a few things you can do, a step you can take, two steps you can take to fan the flame of your love at the same time obeying our submission to his mission through the Great Commission. You know that this church is a gospel-centered, disciple-making church, a church-planning church. So the call for you this morning, if you want to fan that flame, be part of a small group. I'm a part of a small group, and where are they? Can you put one? Hey, hey, 
We're small. And these guys are weird, trust me. It's been like four or five years. And they actually now like me, you know. I love these guys. And we just sat Thursday night eating acai and a shuhasku. And we just said, this is incredible. We're kind of doing what the world does, just a bunch of guys eating a lot of food that we shouldn't be eating at a late night. But then we go somewhere different. And someone gives a word, someone gives a testimony. We open the scriptures, and we always leave here loving Jesus more. More committed to the cause, to the mission. There are plenty of small groups to be part of. Join a small group for the purpose of discipleship. Join others who love Jesus here at 8.30 in the morning on Sunday. Did you know that we have a group that love Jesus so much they come at 8.30 to pray? And then at 9, others are here studying the Word of God. Be part of that if you'd like. Get involved with one of our church plants. This church, sponsoring through Restore Brazil, various church plants. Start something new. Maybe God has impassioned you for something, or you're saying, yeah, I need something, I want to start something. Start something new where you can call others, where you're either studying the scriptures or going to do something that Jesus would do so that you together might follow him. Love's reward, love's result, loving Jesus' result, our submission to his mission and the commission. Love's reward and everlasting, ever-increasing portion of God himself in, his, in our lives through his love, his presence, his peace, and his revelation. Amen? Amen.